All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is the uh, second webinar that we um, are doing this year, uh, titled Running an Effective Meeting. And uh, as you can see from the slide, my name is Steve Sabin, president of the Minnesota State College Student Association. Um, before I get into doing the presentation, um, I'm going to be just muting everyone until I get through the presentation. And then um, if you have any questions uh, afterwards, I'll be glad to answer those. And then uh, also, uh, we'll, we will be posting this webinar up on the website uh, shortly, um, within a few days. So that way uh, you can go, uh, go back and view the webinar or share it with others. Okay, so running an effective meeting. Uh, one of the main goals uh, to, or a few goals that we're going to be covering for running an effective meeting is um, allowing you to be more comfortable with the use of Robert's Rules of Order, uh, as well as to be able to utilize them and conduct your meetings more efficiently uh, and uh, more effectively. And then also um, use it to allow you to, you and your uh, senators or uh, club members to have fun. So running an effective meeting. Um, Essentially, an effective and efficient meeting occurs when you're able to form and keep order uh, throughout the meeting, um, which this allows uh, everyone to or allows um, to provide for fairness in the decision making process. It uh, should foster participation from all the members. And then also it allows your business uh, to be completed in a timely manner that you'd like to accomplish. Uh, um, during the meeting. So uh, one of the first and uh, major roles in the meeting is the chair. Uh, the chair essentially mediates all debate. Um, however, they do not enter into that debate. Uh, they recognize speakers. And so um, during a meeting, if someone um, would like to speak, essentially that person would raise their hand and the chair would recognize them. Uh, and then at that point, they would be allowed to speak. Uh, the chair also makes judgment calls when necessary. And then they also are to, like I said, remain impartial at all times. Um, they shouldn't be entering into a debate and taking a side. Um, essentially, the only time a chair would ever really uh, enter into any kind of debate is to um, uh, cite any kind of factual things that would need to be stated. And then they also decide how to run the meeting. Uh, the Roberts Rules of Order book essentially is several hundred pages uh, and by no means in, say, a club meeting or even some Senate meetings uh, would be kind of expected to run the meeting to the to the T, uh, how Roberts Rules is laid out. And so it's up to the chair how um, strict or how loose they would like to run the meeting. So to cover some basics of Roberts Rules of Order, uh, the first key piece uh, to list, um, let everyone know what's going to be covered in the meeting is by having an agenda. This allows for um, your business to be laid out, showed everyone when things are going to be discussed during the meeting, uh, and um, allows them something to uh, refer back to. Uh, there are also, anytime there's, uh, a, say, someone uh, makes a proposal, or you need to, the Senate needs to make a decision on an item, you essentially have motions that uh, allow the, the uh, formal um, decision to be made. And then you have uh, what are called requests, inquiries, and incidental motions. And I'll be covering those a little later. So um, as far as the agenda goes, um, agenda can be pretty, pretty simple. Uh, generally, it's the chair that establishes uh, the, I should say, agenda. Um, the president of the, of the, say, the Senate or the chair of the, the meeting or the club. Um, and then the agenda essentially allows for the framework for an effective meeting. So here's kind of a sample agenda. Uh, first thing um, that should happen with all meetings is essentially the, the chair will call the meeting to order. And then um, you'll allow for an approval of the agenda. Um, at this time, if there are any additions or changes or spelling errors that need to be corrected, this would be the point where that would occur um, as far as the agenda goes. 
And then the next item on uh, the agenda should be the approval of the minutes. And the minutes are the record of the previous meeting uh, that describes um, what occurred in that meeting and any motions that were made, um, any elections that occurred, anything that was discussed during that meeting. And um, oftentimes, especially for Senate, these minutes um, are used uh, amongst the college as kind of, an, kind of an official record of, say, a purchase or um, decision to use any kind of funds. So it's really crucial that these minutes are kept pretty descriptive of uh, what happened in that meeting. And then um, this next item would be any old business. Uh, this would be items that were discussed at the last meeting, but uh, were not, say, you know, a decision wasn't made or more research had to be done. Um, you would bring uh, those items up at old business so that you can finish them first before going on to anything new. Uh, and then new business is, again, anything brought up that meeting for the very first time. And then lastly, you should leave in room, any room for announcements um, from you know, whatever uh, the chair would decide, whether it be, say, uh, during a Senate meeting, any kind of club announcements or anything anyone would want to talk about. And then um, at the end, the um, chair would either ask for a motion to adjourn or simply adjourn the meeting. So uh, we'll go on to motions. Uh, first, uh, one of the very first things, say if uh, someone were to come to the Senate meeting and propose that the Senate buy a, uh, a car for um, the, any of the Senate members to use. In order to uh, approve that proposal or even deny it, um, a motion should be made and simply stated, you know, someone would say, I move to approve the purchase of this car. Uh, and then the next step in the um, process is, say if someone uh, wanted to limit how much, uh, or actually what color the car would be, uh, then they would amend that motion and say, I move, or I amend, move to amend the, the motion to state that we buy a red car. Uh, and um, then, uh, <clears throat> um, after, you know, say if there was discussion that someone wanted to pick a more specific color of red, then they would move to amend the amendment to say uh, a neon red. Uh, and so after that amendment to the amendment is made, one thing to uh, uh, keep in mind is that uh, no other amendments or motions can be made up to, um, after that point. So uh, all the at least the amendment to the amendment has to be resolved or voted on um, before anything else is uh, any any other progression is made on um, the the motions. Um, another thing to keep in mind: any time a motion or a, an amendment is made, um, essentially the person that makes the motion is the uh, the maker of the motion, and then there always has to be a second to that motion. And then after a second is made, then they'll go into a discussion period. And then during discussion, um, you can either have debate on, uh, you know, say uh, whether or not to purchase the car if people felt strongly for or against. That's the point they would do it. Um, but discussion is also the point where these amendments would be made. If a person makes a motion and there's no second, then you cannot propose an amendment uh, at that point, you'd have to have a second first. Um, so then going on to the main motion, uh, like I uh, kind of stated, um, the main motion initiates any action on an agenda item. And then um, like I also said, it has to be seconded and discussion, discussion cannot start without that second. Um, but uh, one thing to keep in mind to allow for healthy debate um, you do not have to essentially support the motion in order to second it. If you're against it, um, you know, you, it, it's not going to say anything that you second the motion. Essentially, all it does is allow for a healthy debate on it and um, see what the majority of, you know, how the majority of the Senate feels or the uh, majority of your group. So then going on to an amendment of the motion, 
Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this amendment must not change the intent of that initial motion. So say if I were to, if the motion was to buy a car and then all of a sudden um, an amendment was made to um, say, I, I want to buy pizza as well. Um, that changes the initial intent as you initially was just to buy a car. And so this amendment also has to be seconded. And again, you do not have to support the motion in order, in order to second it. <clears throat> and the same goes for amendments to the amendments as well. So going on to now that you've had discussion and no one has anything else to say, then you go on to a vote. And if the chair feels that no one else or sees that no one else is going to add anything, then he'll call for a vote. This can be done in many different ways. Essentially, the chair will, can, um, will be the first to decide how the voting is, method is, what voting method is used. Um, however, uh, a member of the, the Senate or the club can um, ask for a specific voting method if maybe they feel that there's kind of a, a split decision. Um, and then um, <clears throat> oftentimes during the voting methods, um, there is an option to abstain. Um, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is to, before any you know vote of abstention is made, maybe uh, should look at um, really using it only in a specific motion that kind of compels you to not take a side or if it may not be in the best interest or be a conflict of your interest. So when you get onto the vote, um, there's kind of three main different voting uh, votes that are called that will be looked at. Uh, say if you're on to the part of the agenda where you're going to approve, say the agenda or the minutes, um, commonly used, uh, the chair would just simply ask for general consent. And by doing that, he would basically ask if there are any objections from the members um, to approve the agenda or minutes by general consent. If there are no objections, then the chair would just assume that uh, the motion carries and that um, say the agenda is passed then. Uh, for your common motions or amendments, um, they generally are uh, done by a simple majority vote, which essentially means half of an, um, all the voting members present plus one. So uh, say if there are 10 members present, 10 voting members present, the motion would pass if six people voted um, yay or yes. And then uh, the last voting method, uh, this one is commonly used for if you're amending your constitutions um, and it's a two thirds majority. And this is only used when specified typically by bylaws or constitution. And a two thirds majority um, generally is a two thirds majority of um, your voting members or um, your entire roster, depending on how it's specified. So uh, let's go into some other kind of just general various motions that you may see come up or could use. Um, a call to question, um, it, essentially uh, it, say if debate is going on and um, a lot of people are kind of debating, you know, adding to the debate and it's just kind of keeping the tires moving in the same direction, you're not really getting anywhere. Um, someone calling for a call to question would essentially end the debate immediately uh, and then you would go to a vote um, to decide whether or not you're going to um, end discussion and immediately vote on the motion at hand. And so by doing a call to question, um, it would have to pass by a two thirds uh, majority vote. And then if that call to question were to pass, then you would go on to um, say if we're on the motion to buy the car, then you would immediately go to a simple majority vote um, to approve the purchase of that car. Uh, <clears throat> then another uh, motion um, that you might see is to table a motion. Uh, this would essentially end debate on a motion if it were to be um, approved. Um, it would end debate on a motion until a later time. Um, and that would be essentially a late, until a later time in the meeting. And to approve this motion, it would require a simple majority vote. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, this is one that's um, commonly misused as uh, 
um, oftentimes say if a motion uh, you need to do more research on it and the majority is to put it off for another week um, oftentimes table uh, motion to table is used which in fact it should be a motion uh, to postpone until that meeting um, if a motion to table is used and the decision on that motion is not approved by the end of the meeting then it's essentially um, uh, for lack of better terms, killed the motion is killed, and then it has to be redebated at the next meeting. So uh, we'll go on to some points of interest. Um, these are some uh, that could be used uh, either to gather information or um, to allow others to uh, be able to uh, add to the business of the meeting. Um, the first one is a point of information. Uh, say if uh, we're on the motion to buy a car and you're not on, you, you're wondering if the Senate even has enough money to purchase the car. Uh, during the meeting, you could essentially ask for a point of information and uh, the chair would recognize you and you would ask, you know, point of information, do we even have enough money to buy the car? And so this would allow for um, then the information to be gathered for you and uh, help you make your decision on the motion. Um, another thing to remember is that the point of information uh, should have, should essentially be related to the motion at hand that's being discussed. Um, like if we're on the motion to buy a car, point of, uh, in a, an out of order um, point of information would be uh, when is the next Senate meeting? Uh, or it could be considered an out of order. Uh, moving on to a point of privilege, uh, a point of privilege is essentially a request that uh, will allow um, you to um, be able to uh, or allow the meeting to be more conducive to business. Say if there's a lot of background chatter and you know, it's kind of hard to hear the discussions or anything that's going on, then you could essentially ask for a point of privilege and ask for, say, the noise to be uh, lowered. Um, or discussion to be, or the side talk to be ended. And then lastly, a point of order. A uh, point of order is a, allows you to claim that um, a part of the Roberts rule is not being followed. Uh, say if someone made a motion and it was seconded, and then the chair immediately asked for a vote, uh, then you could call a point of order and say that no discussion was allowed. And then the chair would have to back up and then allow for that discussion. And none of these need to be seconded or voted on. So uh, that's kind of some basics in a nutshell for running an effective meeting. Um, some resources that you uh, can utilize to read up on um, other parts of Robert's rules uh, are, I have included here. Uh, the first one, um, this is everything Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, there is a new 11th edition that was released. Um, which can be gotten at any bookstore or anything. Um, I have a link, there's a hyperlink here included um, for when you pull up the PowerPoint later. Um, uh, but this one is anything and everything you need to know about Robert's Rules. Uh, the second one I have, uh, this is more of a, uh, as, a, as the name implies in brief, kind of a summarized edition of Robert's Rules. Uh, if you're not going to, you know, use Robert's Rules as strict, um, this would maybe be a better um, book to get. And then um, another uh, resource I have here, uh, when we uh, post the uh, PowerPoints uh, on the, the websites, um, you can click on this link and I have some common definitions for motions that you might um, see or hear or want to use uh, in the meetings. And so you can uh, use that uh, chart as well.